we are recording this uh, conversation. So just so you know, uh, only the speakers will be recorded. Um, so those who are participating, if you speak, then you will be recorded as well. But if you don't speak, you won't, just so you know. But welcome everyone. And please note that um, if you need Spanish or French interpretation, uh, you can access that interpretation in by clicking the globe icon under your screen. It's called interpretation. So if you need access to Spanish and French interpretation, you can just click there your language and you will have the whole conversation in Spanish and French. Uh, we apologize for not translating into more languages, but uh, this is what we managed to do. And we're going to wait a little bit more, at least three minutes more, so we get more people on board, so then we can start. Yeah. Meanwhile, while we wait here, because we have already 38 people waiting, I want to ask you to put in the chat an emoji that represents your mental health today. How is your mental health? I think emojis are a great way to um, express our feelings. So if you are already on board, and if you would like to share your feelings and your mental health, please share an emoji in the chat so we can have a, an idea how you feel today. <laughs> Any smiley faces? That's good. Okay, somebody's not that great. There's a lot of things going on there with victory. <laughs> uh, I always like to use the rainbow emoji as well. Nice. Let's wait a little bit more so we can get started. Yeah, so for those who, uh, again, need Spanish or French interpretation, I just want to make sure that you know there is interpretation available. So you can click on the globe icon below uh, your screen. And if you have any issues, technical issues, do let us know so that we can arrange this for you. We just wait a little bit more so we can get started. We have now 42. Okay, so I assume everybody has already the, the interpretation set, so everything is there, settled. Um, yeah, welcome everyone. I just want to, yeah, welcome everyone that is here. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you today. As I said, this is being recorded, but only the speakers will be um, screened uh, and recorded. Um, so I want to first introduce myself. So I am Dennis Van Van Roy. So I am a member of the ShareNet Community of Practice, the LGBTI Health Community of Practice. I'm also um, an advisor on sexual reproductive health and rights at Kitt Royal Tropical Institute. And I am a proud member of the LGBTI community and have been working on LGBTI issues um, the past decades and also on mental health programs. And this session today is um, about, as you know, LGBTI and mental health. Um, and we will be looking at these issues through the lens of online mental health support services. So we're trying to look at services that are available for the LGBTI community, but online. And we have examples from um, 
Singapore, from New Zealand, and also from the Netherlands. Um, and before we dive into that, I also want to mention with everyone that 70 states in the world still criminalize LGBTI people. Um, and these harmful laws and social norms have an incredible impact on our community. Um, so it's not a coincidence that LGBTI people experience mental health uh, concerns. Um, I also want to mention that these online services are not new necessarily. They became very popular during COVID when we could not uh, reach people, but they existed before as well. So the purpose of the session today is to share the experience and the lesson learned from the people working in the field. Um, our speakers, our amazing speakers for today. We have, uh, we're gonna have like a moderated conversation. So around four questions. So it's not presentations. We're gonna have conversations about four questions. And um, by the end of the session, there will be a Q and A. Um, so you will be able to ask your questions and hopefully get them answered by the speakers. Um, meanwhile, if you have comments, reactions, or emojis you want to share in the chat, please do so, because um, that's quite uh, important for us to, to, to know as well how you're feeling during the session. I also want to thank Linga Triutama, which is the person that developed this, uh, the concept for today's session. So thank you, Linga. I also want to thank my colleagues, Hannah and Gaia, who gave the technical support to set up this uh, meeting and uh, also the LGBTI community of practice uh, members who supported us in developing this session. And now I wanna go for our distinguished speakers for today who are a mix of activists and social workers and academics in working in this field. Um, first, we go with Leo Yangsa, the executive director of Oga Chaga, Singapore's only LGBTIQ affirming counseling organization. We also have uh, Jennifer DeLang, a PhD candidate at the University of Groningen, uh, specialized on online treatment for LGBTI plus youth in the Netherlands with suicidal thoughts. We also have today Matthijs Lukasen from New Zealand. Thank you for um, being with us in with different time zone. Um, a senior lecturer in the School of Health, Wellbeing and Social Care at the, universe, at the Open University and a specialist of the Rainbow Sparks, a computerized cognitive behavioral therapy program addressing depression in sexual minority youth. Uh, and the last speaker for today is Freya Ter Terpstra, uh, coordinator for the online platform Gender Pratches at the Transgender Network Netherlands which provides support for trans and non-binary youth in the Netherlands. So these are amazing speakers. And um, to kick off, um, please, the next slide. Um, to kick off, I want to ask the first question for our panelists, which is basically, why did you choose to provide online services or why you're researching online services and why you selected LGBTI people in your work? Um, I want to open the floor for our speakers. If you can please um, stop sharing the um, PowerPoint so we can see our amazing speakers today. And if you want to get started, please go ahead. Um, if done, then I'll start. Um... The question, of course, I, I work primarily as an ethicist in all of the fields I do, so both research and as coordinator of our uh, online uh, mental health service, Gender uh, Maybe the question of why we support LGBTI people is not necessarily so relevant as we're a, um, an organization which supports trans and non-binary people as TNN. Um, but uh, as is an online support service, uh, Gender Praatjes, um, it's an online uh, anonymous chat, which is made to be as accessible as possible to uh, gender questioning youth, necessarily. Uh, we really started it at the start of COVID um, because we noticed that uh, suicide numbers were increasing massively uh, among our, um, uh, among that base. And, um, that something drastically had to be done to 
to support those youth. Great, Freya. Thank you. Um, does anybody want to comment on that? Or have you experienced working with youth, LGBTI youth in your country? I can go next. Maybe I can just start by introducing myself and uh, my organization just very quickly. So as introduced earlier, my name is Yang Fa. I'm a registered social worker in Singapore. Um, if anyone is not yet familiar with Singapore, well, in one sentence, I'd like to introduce Singapore as a high income developed country in Southeast Asia. And we are also one of the last few non-Muslim majority countries that still criminalizes gross indecency. And in our legislation, that means consensual same-sex intimacy between adult men in private and in public and the legislation is still there in place. It has an impact not just on gay and bisexual men, it also has an impact on the wider LGBTQ community. And as an organization, Uga Chaga, uh, we are quite established in Singapore within around for 20, 20 or so years. And our key services uh, for all our members of our community include uh, WhatsApp, email, and professional counseling in person as well as our youth program, which we actually started last year in the middle of uh, the pandemic, in the early months of the pandemic. And uh, right now, our, our youth program is uh, currently run through online outreach and Zoom sessions, um, of course, because of all the pandemic restrictions. And um, just, uh, just to echo what Freya was saying earlier, of course, it's something we really, really worry about for our youth community here in Singapore. Uh, the mental health of our youth community because a lot of research, a lot of experience tells us that younger people are really affected by uh, connections or lack of connections. And of course, uh, physical space is always uh, in shortage here in Singapore. We are a very small country. Physical spaces are expensive, or sometimes not so accessible. So young people do need to find safe, queer affirming spaces online to get support for themselves, whether it's during the pandemic or support for themselves in general for mental health or just to find connections. So that's the Singapore context for us. Thank you so much. It's interesting that you mentioned the safe online spaces because online spaces are not always considered safe, right? So it's also the question on how you create safe spaces online and what is necessary for that. Thank you for that. Um, Jennifer, do you wanna share some thoughts also from your experience in Matai? Do you wanna go next? I will, uh, I can go next. Um, yeah, well, during my uh, PhD, uh, we developed an uh, online uh, intervention for LGBT youth with uh, suicidal thoughts. So we actually started developing it before the pandemic. And um, the main reason was that um, while some young LGBTQ people um, are uh, not out to their uh, parents, for example, or grow growing up in a uh, non-affirming uh, environment, mm -hmm. and for them it can be really difficult to go to the GP, for example, and um online anonymous uh, mental health care uh, can be an option for uh for them to go to um yeah so that's the reason why uh, an online we developed an online intervention um but also um, because uh, if someone is having suicidal thoughts it can be uh, difficult to share them with uh, someone close to them and uh, when you provide them online care, uh, at least they can reach out for help anonymous. Yeah. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, I'm, I hear the, the word reach being mentioned by the speakers, the importance of reaching populations that we normally don't reach. Um, Matthijs, do you wanna share? I see a hand from Danny. Danny, just for you to know that um, you're able to ask questions in the end, okay? For now, we're just going to have um, uh, the first round of questions for the speakers. Yeah. 
please go ahead, Matthijs, if you want to share more about why you selected um, online services and why for LGBTI people. Yes, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm actually in England. I've got, I've got, um, I'm uh, work at the Open University, uh, but I still have an honorary role at the University of Auckland. So um, I'm, uh, I'm sort of across the planet, and I guess it's because of uh, virtual working and online environments that um, I can still um, do that. Um, my interest has been um, around supports as well as everyone else in terms of online supports for um, LGBTI um, young people. Um, the work that I've been focused on has been more at the moderate to mild to moderate in terms of mental health challenges that young people can face. Um, and as a result of that, the focus has been on self-help. So I guess online environments uh, vary quite considerably in terms of how we provide support. And so at one end, one end of the spectrum, you have the synchronous um, support that's uh, provided in real time with young people. Um, and my work's been mostly at the other end of that spectrum. It's the self-help that young people can access at a time and a place that suits them. Um, the work's been around um, a serious game called Sparks, which has been available in New Zealand uh, for the last five years. Um, in an adaptation of that um, called Rainbow Sparks um, for LGBTI um, young people. Um, the challenge, I think, well, there's loads of challenges. We're going to get onto the challenges. I just have to talk about the why at this stage. But the why is, of course, underserved population, um, as the other panel members have mentioned, um, unique um, experiences and challenges and uh, that services aren't necessarily delivered in a safe or effective manner for LGBTI um, young people. So we do have to create solutions that are going to work. Um, my, my work's mostly in research, and so I'm also really keen um, to help come up with solutions. I feel like in the research sphere, there's a lot of focus on describing the problems. So I, um, uh, yeah, I'm really motivated to look at what are some of the solutions. Thank you, Matthijs. I also see that the four speakers have a lot of experience working with youth. So before we jump into the next question, I have a follow-up question on that. Like, um, do you are you also able to reach uh, populations that are not young, so um, elderly people through online services? I'm just curious. Well, yeah, well, my research mainly focuses on youth and young people, so until 29. So above that, I, I don't really know. <laughs> well, I have a response to that. Uh, I don't know whether it's a direct response. Uh, yes, part of our work with the community does involve reaching um, people who are not young, uh, anyone who is above youth age. One of our challenges, and maybe also it's also uh, something that's really important to bear in mind is online access is uh, different for different age groups. Again, back to Singapore's context, we're highly urban and high population density. And in terms of uh, access to the internet, pretty easy. And also cost of mobile devices, pretty affordable. So uh, internet access for majority of population is easy. However, there's still a minority of uh, the community, the LGBTQ community who, for whatever reason, maybe for financial language or kind of a other reasons who are not able or just prefer not to go online. And so that is a serious consideration for, for us. And we are working with uh, not young uh, populations, or community members. We often hear that um, the online community might just be too much uh, for them. So sometimes they, they, they still like the coming down and having those meetings with us in the office. So that's important. And back to the Singapore context as well. Um, space is limited in Singapore, office space in particular, physical spaces. And when those spaces are available, it is expensive and sometimes not accessible. So for us in Ubichaga, we've kind of like treading or balancing the doing work online and doing work in physical spaces as well. And then of course, with our pandemic restrictions, it's really a very important consideration. Um, maybe to just one more point about um, safe online spaces, the same safety considerations need to put in place for a, 
for physical spaces as well, whether it's COVID safety or even just queer affirming LGBTQ safety. That's something that is still applicable. Thank you, Young Pa. Does anybody want to add? Because I see we are already talking a bit of the challenges, which is the next question. We can also jump to the next question if you want to. I just I like to quickly... Nodding. Oh, sorry. No, please go ahead. I see you're nodding. That's what I said. Yeah, <laughs> I, I was thinking for us um, as teen and, and gender projects, it, projects um, it is not necessarily a challenge. We do get um, people because our age range is tw 12 to 25 largely. Um, uh, we largely focus on listening and mutual recognition with youth um, because we notice that is something that is vitally important to the group that is the hardest to reach, um, which are youth that are so dependent on their parents, on their social circles, uh, which do not know other LGBTI people in their circles and are not out yet. And those people are so, so, so hard to reach as TNN um, or with other support services that um, our mental health service has mostly been focused on that, on reaching that group by social media, via accessibility and uh, anonymity, et cetera. Um, and we, we do get older people in our chat, but they are generally much more easy to reach in the trans and non-binary category at least, um, because they're, they're not dependent on others in seeking healthcare, uh, seeking others like them, and they have, generally have more accessibility to physical spaces as well, which these youths generally do not. Thank you, Freya. And when you say listening to mutual recognition, what do you mean exactly by that? Just for the people who are yeah, joining so, the session. Yeah, so we have a team of, uh, I think soon of 20 uh, experiential experts. Uh, so they're all trans and non-binary students mostly. So still young enough to be sort of in the same age range, but not too young uh, so that they're also uh, semi-professionals, most of them. Uh, are studying in education, uh, applied psychology, that sort of range. Um, and everyone is either trans or binary and has been uh, trained in suicide prevention, um, uh, communication, uh, uh, th therapeutic communication in a sense, uh, and also signaling um, uh, domestic violence, etc. So we train them as wide as we can, uh, but generally they already have so much uh, to help with as experiential experts, so we mostly focus on that. Um, so whenever somebody comes who is questioning their gender identity or is trans or non-binary, uh, comes into our chat, they're 100% sure to meet someone that can understand them, knows what they go through, and also knows the medical system, etc., uh, from experience. So that's mostly what I mean with uh, mutual recognition. Great, thanks for, for clarifying that. I wanna go for the next question. Um, so since you're all doing research or providing services um, about online services, um, so I'm wondering whether you encountered any challenges or gaps in your work or in your research. Um, Young Fa already mentioned some of them, maybe you want to expand a bit on that um, and the others as well. Yeah, for uh, me, like our intervention consists consists of um, eight sessions, and it's based on cognitive behavioral therapy, and it's uh, carried out by Patent Online at the moment. And um, well, what we see like um, related to online mental health care, it's uh, the dropout rates are quite high, and with online and with anonymous healthcare, it's not always possible to do a follow-up. Uh, so sometimes that is a challenge. And also with uh, our sessions are without video or audio. So it's not possible to see or hear focal or uh, facial expressions. And uh, that can sometimes be a, a challenge um, as well, I think. Uh, yeah. And is there any way you can prevent the dropout, Jennifer? That you saw um, in your research? 
Uh, well, n yeah, no, we're still carrying out the intervention. So for now, we don't really see how we can uh, prevent the, the dropouts. No. Mm -hmm. Cool. Do, do others have experience of challenges and gaps in services and programs? And I think for for the self help end of the the spectrum, and um, one of the big challenges is around how bespoke do you go? How specific do you go with with populations? So the the interventions, the, the handful of interventions that are designed for LGBTI um, young people in terms of their mental health, um, that's quite a broad group in itself. So um, in consultation with, say, um, intersex groups in New Zealand when looking at SPARKS, um, the feedback has very much been that they need something more focused on their needs. Um, and then the challenge is trying to get the funding, the additional funding to make those sorts of changes. So I guess one of the big challenges is around whether or not you adapt a, an existing mainstream resource or whether or not you develop a bespoke resource. And if you're going for a bespoke resource, do, how, how specific do you focus on the subpopulations? Um, when we've looked at the SPARKS data, um, SPARKS, the general program, is not working as well for um, trans and gender diverse young people as it is for for others so there's lots there's quite a lot of um, challenges there thank you Matthijs well Freya yeah, yeah. yeah please go ahead just quickly at the point I just that just came to my mind about online services uh, well maybe it's a, it's a challenge and also an observation we've made in the past 20 years as well I mentioned that we our online services are uh, email counseling, WhatsApp counseling, and uh, our youth program, which is currently online. We have found that over the years, it really helps to kind of have complementary in-person office-based services. Um, it's just how the services evolve over the years for us. Um, whether it is um, clients losing contact with the services, We've actually found that maybe a bit similar, but maybe also different. We actually know of members, young people in particular, uh, who initial contact with the organization is through online services. What I call the, they are checking us out um, by just chatting to us anonymously, uh, emailing us or using WhatsApp to contact us. And after a while, uh, maybe they find that, hey, maybe the person that they're talking to or the the organization's uh, reputation as queer affirming, as confidential, really is kind of credible. And then from there, we actually have noticed they've transitioned from using the online services to be ready and willing enough to come in for the in-person professional counseling services. I have to admit, when we designed the services, that wasn't the intention. Uh, when we designed the services uh, in, in our history, we assumed that we would be reaching different people. But then over the years, we've found that there's overlaps, that young people in particular, if I, if I remember correctly, young people as well as transgender clients, they check us out through online services, they feel ready to come in for the in-person services. And just something I remember with our statistics, we've noticed that a larger number of trans-identified and gender-diverse clients, younger trans clients, they tend to prefer to contact us through email, um, rather than, so the first contact with us might be through email. I mean, for some of you in the audience, you might think that's a pretty old fashioned way of doing online intervention, but it kind of works for some people. And we realized that maybe it's because it's email, it's not real time. So it's not like WhatsApp and it's not like a, a telephone hotline where there's the phone voice and there's no face to face on email. The client, the young person contacting us has a lot more control over how much they want to share, um, how little they want to share, and also they have control over whether they, um, they want to send it off today or send it off tomorrow. And when we do respond to their email, they can decide uh, whether they want to read it or not. So I think that's something we've kind of observed, which is quite interesting, uh, email. Um, and now, of course, we do have clients, like I said, who feel ready after contacting us by email, they are ready to come in if they want to, the option is mm. to open. 
I found really interesting that you mentioned that online services don't have to necessarily replace regular services, right? They can be complementary to each other. Freya, do you want to add something to this last question, to this question specifically? You haven't talked yeah, about it? Yeah, I also want to respond um, uh, to Yangfa just there. I, I, I think there might also be interesting national differences there because uh, um, most of uh, the people we help that primarily seek our help via email, uh, which we do offer similarly to chat, so people can chat with us anonymously, and that's kind of the main function, but it is set as an alternative also to calling and emailing, uh, but mostly only uh, like 12 year olds, the youngest group mails us or the oldest group who we don't necessarily help. Everyone in between um, in our uh, uh, target audience seeks to prefer uh, anonymous chats, but maybe that's also because of its uh, full anonymity. So the fact that there's no personal information involved whatsoever, so that might feel a little bit more accessible in that sense. Um, regarding uh, challenge this week's we seek, I uh, yeah, it's it's also the fact that we can't hear people hear uh, the channel in their voice, etc. Um, generally, that's not so much a problem, except in the cases of like um, unaccepting parents, uh, which really might escalate uh, domestic violence or uh, sexual assault, etc. Because those are cases where we might need or want to uh, intervene in a sense, uh, but we often can't because uh, it's much harder via chat uh, for them to give us the information that we need than it would be via telephone, etc. So that wide accessibility via online anonymous chat is great, um, but it also in some sense limits what we're able to do. Uh, which in turn might be better since we're not professional healthcare employees, but experiential experts, so maybe that's fine. Uh, but mainly what I think is a big problem that we run into is that uh, in the Netherlands, sort of the non-professional support services um, are quite plenty full. So there, there are quite a, a number of them but they're all very small scale. So gender is, is a little bit more large scale in that sense, because we get um, ministerial funding. Uh, but I, th I think a lot more could be reached if uh, a lot of these smaller non-professional sports serves would work together in a sense and not invent a new one each single year for a different target audience. Um, though there are exceptions, I think, regarding intersex people, because what you said, Matthijs, we've also run into that before. Um, because I, I think the, the largest problem in the Netherlands right now is for trans and non-binary youth specifically is that the first contact that they have uh, when coming out, et cetera, or seeking help generally doesn't know anything about what to do. So either that's a school administrator or uh, somebody who knows nothing about where to send them, um, or it's a parent who has to search with them, uh, or a GP, which generally doesn't know either. Um, so for us, it's a challenge to, to reach those youth as early as possible so that they know um, they are recognized that where to go and we can sort of slowly lead them into a way that might be most beneficial for them uh, in sort of more of a, a um, um, a peer way in a sense, but that's difficult because most of those first contacts see uh, so many different support services don't know where to send it to and don't have the time to fully dive into this community because it is also complicated regarding healthcare, et cetera, and I understand that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that fragmentation doesn't necessarily benefit the field. Thank you, thank you, Freya. I, I, I enjoy your point on the lack of services as well and how uncoordinated it can be. Um, I also hear a bit of, um, yeah, the point of lack of funds, right, to have, a, to scale up these services. Uh, so you, you have for the gender practice some funding from the ministry, but what is the overall funding support to these kind of multidisciplinary ap approaches, right? Um, 
So let's uh, stop talking about challenges and gaps and move a little bit to opportunities and the things that we think we can contribute to and um, the things that we can do to expand our work and to improve our work, to scale up our work. Um, so if the speakers want to share some thoughts about opportunities, that will be appreciated. I don't mind going first. I think there's a world of opportunities. I think the internet and online environments have been revolutionary for LGBTI um, communities. We, we wouldn't be able to have this conversation without um, the internet. And I think it's really been profoundly powerful. I think also if we um, can reflect on what we consider online support, because we're talking about fairly formal services, but there's also a lot that people gain from the informal. So the groups that they're part of on social media and the ways and skillful ways in which LGBTI people manage that and negotiate that to sort of get the most out of um, the online environments. I think um, when it's in terms of self-help tools, I think there can be big advantages uh, across nations and regions if, it's, if there's enough in the way of shared language. So I'm thinking um, with the Say Sparks, we have um, projects that are in other English speaking countries, Australia, Canada, and the UK and Ireland. Um, and saying that, I don't wanna make it sound like that is, uh, that just because it's in the same language that it can be used um, cross-culturally because there's huge variations even within the same um, language groups. Uh, but yeah, I think there's just, I think we're only just beginning to tap into the potential um, of what we can achieve in, in online environments. Um, and there's gonna be heaps more happening um, in the future. Thank you. And thank you for mentioning also language because that can also be a barrier, right? Like not having access to services in your own language, for example. Um, who wants to go next? I just wanna add on to what Matthias has just said about the online environment. I mean, certainly, you know, maybe in the past, what, five, ten years, we've really seen the, uh, the growth of social media. And certainly, well, where we are, I think it's been, well, I say where we are, we are a small country, five and a half million people. So kind of relatively easy to get a sense of um, what kind of what other community groups are doing, which new groups have been formed, uh, what groups have, uh, have been formed on social media in response to kind of very local community needs. So I suppose the opportunity that I'm, I'm describing is kind of look at what's out there so that I think it was Freya who mentioned earlier. So we don't duplicate resources. We don't, uh, we don't reinvent the wheel. We kind of see what other groups, whether it's formal or informal groups are already doing, kind of keep an eye on what they're doing. And then we can do something different while collaborating with them. Again, I say that with a full understanding that my country is a lot smaller than where you are probably. So it's kind of easier to, to keep in touch. But of course, at the same time, there's also value in maybe staying in touch with maybe fellow community groups and maybe fellow community leaders as well, just to kind of stay on the same um, wavelength. Um, not so much coordinate, but more to collaborate. You know, for example, um, uh, in, in, in our context, you know, I try to stay in touch with my fellow community leaders so that we can learn from that experience as well, maybe in terms of online outreach, maybe in terms of certain training uh, programs or volunteer recruitment, for example. So sometimes it may seem like relationships between organizations and sometimes maybe it just be relationships between individuals that kind of helps things uh, get going. So that's where I see some of those opportunities are. And maybe even more at a regional, international level as well. Um, here, here in Asia, I mean, you, many of you probably know that Taiwan's the only place in Asia where there's same sex uh, marriage uh, legalization. And their success story has really been in Taiwan, a lot of the LGBTQ NGOs, they actually proactively found allies in the other social movements the feminist movements, the labor rights movements, the disability movements as well. Because it's back to the good old uh, activism idea of, you know, as individual groups, we will always be a minority, but when the minority, various minority causes kind of come together, we form a grand coalition, 
we can do more together. So that's something uh, I think uh, Taiwan has really taught many of us here in, uh, in Asia. So maybe it's applicable to a European context as well, forming coalitions with other causes. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, Jennifer, do you want to go next? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think, first of all, it's uh, really good to see that there's an increasing attention for sexual and gender diversity. So maybe that also opens some doors to funding or extra funding or something to, uh, so we can, yeah, which we can use for online support uh, resources. And um, more research uh, related opportunities that I see um, is that in our intervention, we send out uh, questionnaires after every session. So participants can provide feedback on what was helpful for them or what was not helpful for them in those um, sessions. And hopefully in this way, we can uh, strengthen the intervention or um, use the helpful aspects uh, to uh, integrate in other uh, already existing e-mental health uh, interventions, for example. Um, yeah, so that's more research related uh, opportunities that I see, yeah. Thank you, thank you for that as well. Um, maybe just adding one thing that was also mentioned here about funding. Um, what we see also in the Netherlands is that the development funding uh, is shifting from uh, provision of services to now um, pushing organizations in the global south to um, do advocacy and pressure their governments to provide services. But just as a reminder, LGBTI communities are still criminalized in 70 countries, and there's a lot of stigma and discrimination still happening in all the countries, probably. Um, and it's really hard for activists at the national level to um, get their government accountable and uh, receive the funding necessary to be able to do this service provision work at the national level. So I think this conversation around funding needs to happen in a bigger scale, not just at the national level, but also at the global level. How do we fund sufficiently services and not just advocacy? Um, and I want to move from there to the next question um, that cannot be also linked to this question. Um, that is, what kind of actors of change, right? So we want to see change. Uh, what kinds of actors of change still need to be engaged in this conversation, either to improve services or to scale up funding or to create more collaborations, like was mentioned in the session today? So who are we not talking to that should be in this conversation from your experience? I assume there's a lot of people <laughs> we are not talking to. <laughs> if I, I just chip in with, with, with my thoughts. Um, I mean, funders, I mean, we've talked about funders and I think what can be challenging from the research side is to get, is determining who is going to be responsible for um, funding, say, evaluation, evaluation, development evaluation, and then dissemination. I think a real challenge for interventions um, is that uh, if they have had uh, formal evaluation, um, they get stuck in the lab, so to speak, and they never get out to the real world. Um, and so I think it's, there's quite a few actors in that sort of process, but we have, um, in the academic literature, there's a growing um, number of interventions, but many of those are never getting used outside of a research context. Um, and then I think for existing services, they can struggle to get the funding for evaluation. Um, and so it's a, there's sort of problems either end. For the services that already exist, there can be challenges from the research side. And for those things that are being built up from the ground up, so to speak, um, it can be really difficult to, to get funders um, to move beyond a sort of a pilot or um, even a clinical trial um, out to the real world. Um, yeah, so there's loads of actors to be to be addressed in terms of fixing the issues. So maybe one of the yeah stakeholders we should be talking more um, based on what you said should, 
could be funders, for example, have more conversations with funders about the needs of having online services. Would that be the case, Matthijs? About yeah, the challenges? Yeah, yeah, I think getting the to um, getting them out there, um, and also I think it's co connected to some of the the challenges we've already talked about. Like, um, I think that many funders are quite risk averse, so they will be worried about the safeguarding factors. They'll be worrying about. I mean, Yennefer's work is is inspirational, as is everyone's work is inspirational. But in terms of the um, in terms of the research sort of environment um, and interventions that have been developed um, purely starting from a research context, most of the time they will um, completely exclude people that are actively suicidal or self-harming. And that's the case for Frey and um, Youngfer's um, work as well. They, they, they won't exclude those uh, people accessing their services. I don't, it doesn't sound like it, correct me if I'm wrong. And so, that I think is, is a big part of the challenge that the funders um, see the risk and then I think that puts them off. I think that's one of the big things. Thank you. Well, I have one or two things to say about funding. Uh, well, I suppose as a country in the well, global south and global east as well, I think I mean, international funding is always greatly appreciated, especially since when, well, even though we are a rich country, there's very limited funding for LGBTQ causes. And yet at the same time, the conversations with funders need to be about priorities as well. The point about funding for advocacy, that's always very problematic because the environment may not be possible for advocacy for, for, for many uh, countries in the global east and global south. So funding for services might be more appreciated, might be more beneficial, of course, uh, with proper evaluation as well. And one more point about um, um, funders as well, it's also about well, I mean, if, if it's something that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic has taught us, it's the need for the importance of public health. And of course, public health as well as mental health as well, maybe increasingly uh, it's seen as, a, hopefully will be seen as a funding priority, uh, funding services that are focused on healthcare, public healthcare. So maybe the challenge for us in this room is to kind of, start to, well, I think we know it, is that we start to communicate mental health as a public health issue. Because, well, we all know this, mental health is a public health issue, but sometimes we funders don't know it or they don't, they're not yet able to see it. So that's just a thought I have. And maybe just two more groups of um, uh, actors or stakeholders to, to engage with will be, one will be, um, not so much funders, but local businesses. They could be potential funders, I don't know, but certainly local businesses, because we always look at um, international multinationals. They are important for various reasons, but in our various uh, local communities, I think engaging with local businesses is so important as well. Another group of stakeholders that uh, I think it's important to engage with will be parents as well, especially LGBTQ affirming parents. And I'm thinking of two examples. There's been um, a growth, again, uh, with a proliferation of social media in mainland China. There's been a whole proliferation of uh, LGBTQ affirming parents supporting each other. So it's, it was initially based on the PFLAG, uh, American PFLAG model. So it started off as PFLAG China, but of course it's taken a life of its own. So parents, and of course a huge population in China, thanks to one child policy, a lot of the parents now realize that if they are not gonna support their child, nobody else will. So they've really mobilized themselves to support each other as well as uh, their children, their LGBTQ children. And of course, in the US, there's this incredible movement there and so uh, they're on Facebook called Free Mum Hugs. So the idea of, you know, if you are somebody with a parent who is LGBTQ rejecting, you can go to them because this group of mums are LGBTQ affirming and they offer hugs. Well, uh, at Pride events, they are there giving hugs. And they're also online. They also have certain services and provide affirmations as well. So I think that's something that the rest of the world has so much to learn from engaging uh, with parents, affirming LGBTQ, yeah, LGBTQ affirming parents. And also maybe involving parents in the services, right? Like providing services to Absolutely. parents. Absolutely. That's um, something that quite often is done as well. That service be beneficial. Providers. Mm -hmm. Cool, thanks. Uh, Freya or Jennifer, do you want to go next with um, the actors of change that are still not um, 
that we're not engaging with yet or not sufficiently engaging with? Uh, yeah, I can add something to that. Yeah, and I think it's uh, also research related again, it's really important to raise awareness among uh, policymakers and sources that provide funding uh, about the importance of online healthcare for specifically LGBTQ uh, individuals. And um, also um, not really related to online support. I think it's also super important to uh, educate uh, teachers and mental health professionals in general uh, about sexual and gender diversity and uh, the importance of the use of uh, inclusive language, uh, etc. cetera. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Freya? Yeah, I totally agree. Um, jumping back on what Jennifer and Jan just, just said, um, that I think is also one of the main standpoints of TNN and, and uh, gender practice broadly. Um, so we try to mostly uh, market ourselves via schools. So um, in the next couple of months, uh, we'll be sending out posters again to like two, 3,000 schools uh, in the Netherlands so that the first contact there is not necessarily the teachers, but they know, oh, yeah, I can send uh, them here. Uh, but we also do a lot of uh, education uh, as in the interest group, uh, as TNN. Um, and I think that is uh, and has been and will remain for at least one more decade, I think, one of the main focuses of interest groups uh, as education of not only general public or, or educators themselves, but of uh, ministries, of politicians, etc. I mean, TNN has been doing that for a long time uh, and still function as one of the main contacts for LGBTI uh, people um, as sort of a spokesperson necessarily, of course. Uh, and one of the issues that we try to relieve uh, also regarding the gender project projects also that the idea that ministerial funding for these support uh, services is an inherently political thing, which of course is nonsense, but, uh, and really hurts such services, I think, which are non-research based, but perhaps also the, those that are. Um, and I think interest groups have a big responsibility and function in that, in naturalizing those, um, the fact that this is normal, this is very much needed. Um, same as with LGBTI plus research more broadly, I think, specifically regarding trans and non-binary needs and experiences, there's so little research. It is shocking uh, at times. Um, even though there is so many interesting avenues to tackle there. Um, yeah, and more broadly, I, just jumping on what we said earlier, I think a national coalition of support services uh, would be so helpful. Uh, for example, I would love gender practice to be not only focused on trans and non-binary people, but on the whole LGBTI spectrum, but there is a, a coalition needed for that and a lot more funding um, but I think that defragmentation of support services would be so, so incredible because there are national colleagues of ours which try to do this, but they run into the fact that you don't have enough funding for that. But it would be great to have a, a website that is generally known among first contacts in schools, healthcare, et cetera, uh, that is sort of a general first contact service or a recognition service, and then you can just click like, what do you want to talk about? Who do you identify as? And then you get into that group of experiential experts, which you can talk to, ask questions to, etc. Yeah. Thank you, Freya. And also the challenge of showing impact, right? Like the this need that funders have to show the impact. And with services, it's always very tricky, right? Because how, what kind of impact can you show sometimes, right? Uh, in the issue yeah. of evaluating that, like Matei said. Um, we're now um, heading to the Q&A session. I just want to mention here briefly some of the things that I've heard that probably doesn't really capture everything that was heard. But um, I heard panelists talking about the issue of reach. So the opportunity of this kind of online intervention services to reach populations that sometimes we're, we're not able to reach. Um, 
the increased access. So thinking about access, so who has access, who doesn't have access, that's an important question if you're providing these kind of online services. Um, a question that was brought up about targeted, so how targeted services can be uh, or need to be, and the importance of tailoring services for specific needs of populations. Um, it was also mentioned the uh, underserved communities, especially youth and trans uh, communities as uh, in need of these kind of online services and how to access them. Um, something I found really interesting was the issue of co complementarity, uh, that these services don't necessarily replace, you know, in-person services. You can have uh, the two kind of services provided. Uh, you don't have to duplicate services like was mentioned many times here and the need of coordination and not, not just the fragmentation of, um, um, of these services. Uh, so making sure that uh, people who need access can find it easily and that this is coordinated between the organizations. Um, yeah, and then many other interesting things were mentioned around um, funding, that funding is political, uh, the need of scaling up funding for services uh, engaging with different stakeholders like local businesses, communities, local communities with parents, also thinking about what kind of services you can provide for other communities uh, beyond the ones that you currently reach. The need for more research, uh, more evidence-based um, uh, research to showcase the importance of online mental health services, also the need of working towards um, sexual education being more available in, um, in for, for young people and for LGBT people and for communities in general. Um, so I will stop now. So these are just things that I took note of and that popped out in my head while listening to these amazing speakers. Thank you so much for, for bringing um, yeah, so many interesting insights for this conversation. Um, I wanna open the floor for Q&A. Um, and my suggestion is that um, people ask their questions orally. If you are shy, you can also write it in the chat and we try to bring it to the plenary. But uh, I want to open the floor for you to speak directly. If you speak Spanish or French, you can also make your question orally or in the chat, whatever you prefer. And then we translate. Okay, I remember Danny had hands up in the beginning of the session. I don't know if Danny's still there. Or maybe some somebody else has questions to the panelists. Um, you can also direct questions specifically to one or two panelists so that we make sure that we have um, directed question. No questions. <laughs> I've, got a, I've got a comment while we're waiting, Dennis, um, from the, yeah. <laughs> uh, not so much a, uh, somewhat of a question, more of a statement. Um, I guess about, again, if we're talking about the actors and going back to fixating on funders, one of my frustrations would be that they would say, you have to prove that health and social care funders, the commissioners will say, you have to prove it works, but they won't, necessarily provide the funding for or the support to make that happen so it just becomes a bit of a vicious cycle where it's like prove that it works and then you you have to sort of get jump through all these hoops so it, yeah there's, there's just it feels a bit like a spider's web you get stuck in these things i agree totally it, and that's that's the biggest challenge right like how do you convince donors to give the first set of funding um, to organizations. 
but research can play a huge role, right, in showing the importance of that. So I think it links to what Jennifer said before, the importance of having more research that also requires funding, right? So research also needs to be funded. Um, yeah. But maybe questions beyond funding. So really about online tools to people in the audience, the people that are listening to this conversation. Do you think that in your country or in your region, um, you're able to, if you're doing service provision, are you able to do this kind of online services? Did you run into, you know, issues of access or um, challenges with tailoring these services? I'm curious to know, because I don't know you, right? I don't know who's in, in, the, in the room, but if you can speak a bit about your experience and how you see this working in your situation, in your country. Dennis, we, we, sorry. I was just going to say there's a question in the question in the comment box. Yes. Um, was there any way to assess repeat users of the online mental health service? So I think the question here is about um, the, 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 the follow up, right? To be sure that there's consistent if I get the question right, if there is a way of tracking if the same user is um, receiving services continuously and not just a one-off. Yeah, for us that as Jennifer touched that is relatively easy because we're more sort of a hub for a different sort of care. So uh, generally we're uh, a first or second contact and then we send them after a talk of mutual recognition, we send them to a healthcare provider in a sense, or a peer support group or something physical. Um, and then afterwards they come back again, um, oftentimes or sometimes. Um, so we can assess that quite easily. Um, and we have like monthly checkups with the entire uh, team uh, to see whether, um, who has come back, if there are sort of, um, repeat users that are not improving how we can do that etc so we we monitor that mostly as a team but i think for us that's easier because we're more of a hub that people can return to each time yeah for for us i mean similarly to free as well and because what's well, also the nature of our online services as well we use whatsapp counseling and email uh, counseling so those they already identify us with whatsapp there's the number uh, and then, of course, with our email, that's an email address as well. Um, increasingly, when we talk about our online services, we emphasize on the confidentiality of the services because I think, in all honesty, it's it's very hard nowadays to have a truly anonymous service. Uh, I mean, maybe the only one I can think of is maybe a good old-fashioned landline kind of a telephone hotline, which is which can be truly anonymous. But even then. Uh, when it comes to online services, there are ways to identify. So the reassurance is very important for us as service providers to reassure that even though we have your email address, even though we have your WhatsApp number, uh, that it's still uh, kept confidential. And I think uh, just going back to the chat box, I think Danny would like to share their experience. I think that would be yeah, useful to hear. Hello, first uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Danny Hanna, I'm from Beirut. Uh, we work for uh, a mental health program from M Coalition AFE MENA. We have this mental health program that we found a, a need for it after the explosion. But after the explosion, we had so many uh, crises like uh, prevalences of uh, the rate of suicide. We had the, the LGBTIQ, they were uh, a little bit cared for, but uh, they are uh, in this phase left out during a sequel of crisis. Next, uh, we survived a hyperinflation, a judiciary inflation, legal inflation, environmental inflation, security and safety deflation. Then uh, we witnessed the revolution. Then, uh, due to the crisis, the so many crises we witnessed, we then had this uh, electricity cuts, which caused by itself internet co uh, cuts. And because of hyperinflation and because of COVID and quarantine, and people didn't have money, 
they had little access to internet. And this was a challenge by itself. So technically we needed uh, more uh, funds for the beneficiaries, at least for the internet access. So we had also other challenges like uh, uh, people asking and not knowing in such a society that they did not know what is mental health support. They did not know that it's very uh, uh, crucially important for their well for their well being. Uh, they had different thoughts and different conceptions and mostly misconceptions about mental health. So this by itself also was a barrier and uh, to access uh, the services. Uh, this, in short, we lived like uh, two years of uh, trying to do prevention, uh, awareness about what is mental health, uh, a mental health program. Uh, it was like we were inducing, we were uh, incepting a new program, a new concept into a, a community that doesn't know uh, about it. So technically, these are the uh, extra challenges we had to face uh, in our program. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. It's, it's more of a comment than a question, right? But I don't know if some of the speakers want to react to that comment. It did make me think about the importance of context, right? Because LGBT people don't live in a, in a bottle, right? We live in a context and we experience the same challenges that other communities experience, plus the challenge of stigma discrimination. And um, in the research that I've, I'm doing currently in Palestine, it shows really the importance of overcoming this um, stigma around mental health, that many people think that mental health is not for them. That mental health is, uh, you know, not something that they value. I think that's important, or that they should be seeking services, or they can be seeking services. So even when services are available, doesn't mean that necessarily people will uptake them and access them. Um, so yeah, Let's your comment add. made me think about my research. Let yeah. me add to that. I'm sorry to interrupt. Let me add no. because uh, they are so numerous. You almost forgot a dozen easily. Uh, so technically, the LGBT, especially transgender, who were, uh, we witnessed a very big number of people who were thrown out of their house uh, or their rentals or uh, the, the, their shelter. So we faced a situation where uh, people had uh, uh, more, more important needs than mental health, like uh, finding shelter, like finding food. And this was also a barrier on so many levels, but we're focusing on mental health. Sorry to interrupt, but for, for the crisis, I'm sure I forgot a dozen easily, sorry. No, thank you, you didn't interrupt. It, it's exactly what I was thinking. Um, yeah, others want to comment or other questions from the group? I see there's a lot of people online. I can imagine there are many questions. I see Alain, is saying hi from Burundi, but I don't know if Alan has a question. If you want to ask a question in French, please go ahead. We have turn, we have interpretation, so that's possible. Or put it in the chat. So Lucy is asking, I'm curious at the self-help intervention of Matthijs that Matthijs talked about. I can imagine in Holland, we can also use it. So Matthijs, do you want to expand a bit on the self-help? aspect of it? Well, well, you have used it in the Netherlands. Um, so, um, it, it, but in a research context, uh, and I guess the, um, the, the rainbow sparks, we could, not that I'm fixating on the funding thing, but uh, we could never get uh, funding to, to roll out the LGBTI version. Um, and so it's the main version of sparks. It's been used in a, a it's uh, been in a randomized control trial um, Radboud University, Neymar here, um, ran that. Um, so, uh, yeah, and it was with uh, uh, young people with some clinical depressive symptoms. Uh, so, yes, I mean, the challenge then is also when you've, I think, in part, uh, it's 
it relates to um, translation. It relates. It has been translated into Dutch, but also um, the challenges around um, intellectual property. Who will then host um, the data? How secure is the data if hosted in a country? You know, uh, in another country, who pays for sort of ongoing running costs? So it gets to be. You would think it would be quite straightforward, and in our original plan we would have really liked to have made it available from New Zealand to users around the world. But the New Zealand Ministry of Health, which funded the rollout of Sparks in New Zealand, was not very keen on that idea. So you have to have a New Zealand IP address to access the main version. And unfortunately, the, the rainbow version has, um, has not been made available. Thank you, Matthias. I also noticed here now that there's a comment from Carolina in the chat. Uh, Carolina is saying that she's from Colombia and that in, um, in the context of Colombia, this kind not a, she's not aware of this kind of services available, men, online mental health services available for LGBTIQ plus people. Uh, so yeah, so it's, she's excited to know more about this. Um, please feel free to speak up huh? so you don't have to listen to my, my terrible voice. You can also speak up and and ask your question. Don't be shy. <laughs> Can I make a comment or maybe just kind of a, a response to the person in is it Colombia who, who, who talks about not having um, Carolina? Uh, Carolina was right. Thank you. Because I'm thinking, you know, sometimes when uh, in the absence of services, it, it's very tempting to kind of start things from scratch. Well, I would suggest that always start small. So, for example, I'll be curious where you are what are the existing platforms that are popular and then maybe just use those platforms. Um, in Singapore, it's WhatsApp. I know in some other parts of the world, maybe Facebook Messenger, it may be you know, uh, Telegram or Signal or, or maybe just good old fashioned email or chat room. So, so using those existing platforms and then just start small, maybe have um, certain uh, limited hours or maybe specific geographical locations and then get a sense because I know, and, and we have um, OO in our history, we often have many groups here locally asking us for advice on how to start services. And that will be the same advice I give them. Always start small, start with what you have, and then build confidence, build capacity, build resources from that. And I mean, I, I'm sure if you look whether regionally or internationally, there will always be other similar hopefully uh, organizations that are willing to give you advice on how to start as well. I mean, yeah, so, so can, don't worry about having to reinvent the wheel, look at what you have and maybe yeah, and start small. Thank you, Young. Yeah. I'd like to okay. respond to um, uh, the last question uh, asked in the chat. Um, maybe just whether... explain what the question is before so that yeah. everybody knows. Yeah, I'm trying to um, make it as short as possible. So the question is, if it's possible, if it's not possible to work with other more general mental health organizations so that they can refer to the more specific um, uh, sports services and mental health services. Um, that is largely what uh, we're trying to do at TNN, for example, and uh, I think others like uh, Transfizi and CSA similarly, um, for, for gender practice, it is, again, a, a thing of funding. Networking like that broadly in the national context costs a lot of money because it is a lot of time spent um, swimming uh, or, yeah, it, it's, it's an uphill battle in, in that sense because you have to network that and disseminate that information so broadly um, that we had to choose to focus on um, providers that have the most, the highest likelihood of having trans and non-binary uh, people come through them. Uh, but I'd, I'd love to, to put that scope more broadly, but again, that's a funding issue. If I may also uh, respond, I'm, sorry, I'm just reading the chat, it's moving very fast. Uh, I think Lizette Christ, uh, mm -hmm. she asks, uh, if anyone from the organizations here has any experiences with people from other countries asking for help 
what do you do when that happens? Yes, it happens to us here in Singapore. Uh, we do have uh, members of the LGBTQ community in neighboring Malaysia and Brunei. Again, three Southeast Asian countries, three neighboring Southeast Asian countries that criminalize the LGBTQ community kind of in different ways. I mean, we do have a kind of a shared history as well. So in terms of culture, there are also some similarities. So we have found that we have been able to. So of course, in terms of our publicity, and of course we don't tell our funders that, but in terms of our publicity, we say it's a primarily um, Singapore service, but with online services, it crosses uh, uh, national borders. So when people from Malaysia or Brunei email or WhatsApp us, when the same time zone, uh, we will still provide that support. I mean, the only, I suppose, challenge or condition is um, we are still primarily an English speaking service. Um, Singapore is a strange country where we actually have four official languages, a bit like Switzerland, I suppose, but many of our staff and volunteers are more proficient in English as a working language. So um, Malaysians and Bruneians uh, who are comfortable communicating as English, um, do that. And I just want to make a point about how since maybe many of you are Dutch nationals, the Netherlands ambassador to Singapore is also ambassador to Brunei as well. And I've just had the opportunity to update her on this is something that we do. And she was pleasantly surprised to hear that we do provide a support service for the LGBTQ community in Brunei. And of course, some of you may be aware that in Brunei, in the past several years, things have been difficult for the community there. And of course, in Malaysia as well. Uh, with government changes, political changes, there's also uh, persecutions as well. So, and from what we know, there are aren't similar LGBTQ affirming uh, online uh, mental health services in Malaysia and Brunei. So we try to do what we can. It's not perfect. In a perfect world, actually, I wish Ukichaga could train Malaysians and Bruneians to start their own services, but understandably, they really have other priorities at the moment. So if there's anyone out there who wants to replicate these services in Brunei or Malaysia, you know, get in touch with us. We're quite happy to share our experience. <laughs> or funders as well, yeah. We want to fund such services in Malaysia and Brunei, please get in touch. And you know, one of the things that came up, a follow-up question uh, on that is that um, in a context like the Netherlands, for example, of course, not everybody is a Dutch citizen. And there are, I don't know how many nationalities even in Amsterdam, right? So I think the question is also like, can these services at the national level also be considerate of migrant experiences and people who don't have access to the native language in the country uh, and how difficult it is to do this kind of uh, yeah, multilingual work and how costly it can be, if anybody has a thought on that. Yeah, and like the, um, thank you for, for your answer, by the way. And the, the healthcare, navigation part of that is something that I also wonder about because I can imagine that when you are trying to connect people to services that that is where it ends. Freya you mentioned that you try to connect people to services and to other resources. Um, oh, yeah I can imagine that that'd be very hard. Yeah it just costs a lot of time generally because there are so many stakeholders and partners that you want to involve uh, on the national context and it is well, largely equally important to have each of those connected, but to keep an alliance or a healthy connection in that sense just costs a lot of time. And for example, gender practice being run by like two people. So that's generally not time we have necessarily. Cool. Yeah. I see. Oh. Yeah, Jennifer, if I can add to that, yeah. And yeah. Our intervention is also is only provided in Dutch, for example. Um, because also because of it's written in Dutch and the training was in Dutch and it's also a time thing and a cost thing. Um, so we try to, well, we refer them to 113 suicide prevention because they provide uh, support in English. So at least they can get help for their and support for their suicidal thoughts. Yeah. No, thanks for this addition. Uh, I just want to read quickly two comments that are in the chat. Uh, one is from Alba. Alba suggesting maybe to create an international list or database with services available, online services available for the community. I think it's more a suggestion. Um, it's a question, but it's also a suggestion in a way. And Aliu is asking from Gambia, is asking about how 
uh, he, she, or they, I don't know the gender, can benefit from this intervention, this type of intervention. I don't know if you want to react to these two comments. And then we go for Gabriel that has the hand raised. I guess uh, to the point about building up and, and adding to um, Youngfer's uh, points and others' points is, you know, the ability to, to start out smaller. And I guess with, um, you can still have virtual online groups for closed, you know, closed number of, of young people and their interventions where they focus on a particular um, group and then look at their needs. So it could be um, young people coming out around their sexuality, or it could be um, gender diverse young people. Uh, so you, you just would, um, in effect, create a group like you would any other therapeutic group, but it becomes online with tech that doesn't necessarily have to be anything more than, than group chat or something like Zoom. Thank you. Um, Gabriel, you have your hands raised. I don't know if you want to ask your question. Sure, yeah. there. Hello, everyone. I really appreciated your presentations. My name is Gabriel. I'm based at the University of Cape Town, and I thought I'd share three points with you very quickly. The first is I, um, something we're appreciating in, in, in the work in our context is how models um, and approaches used to um, support individuals in relation to their mental health often rely quite heavily on um, Euro-American epistemic practice. Um, and in the South African context, we're trying quite hard to appreciate um, kind of indigenous knowledge systems um, and indigenous forms of healing. Um, and uh, I just wanted to appreciate that. And I guess pose a question around um, the kind of models or approaches you rely on in terms of taking forward your, your work. Um, the second point is we've been using um, quite a lot of uh, creative methodologies, historically, visual arts, performance, etc. And with uh, COVID-19, um, we've obviously tried to shift our work online for the moment, but it's been quite difficult to use those alternate approaches in, in the online space. Um, some of it's been successful, but some of it's been hard. And I think what we're learning are, are the opportunities and the limitations that space can offer to the kind of work we've, we've been doing. Um, and I guess in, in the South African context, in the shift online, we've been um, forced to acknowledge some of the challenges in our context related to access to data, um, access to devices, or even private spaces at home where a person can um, text or type or call um, without feeling like they're being judged or heard, um, especially when living in very high dense kind of neighborhoods or areas. And I think the biggest challenge has been negotiating some of those um, you know, class uh, or social social economic challenges um, in using these these approaches, um, and I wondered about whether you face similar challenges in terms of um, it, you know class inequalities or social economic inequalities as as well. But yeah, thank you so much. It's been really interesting. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, yeah, I think the question is for all of you. Does somebody want to react to it? So there are two questions, right? So one on the indigenous knowledge and healing, if you have experience or you thought about that, and the other one is about the opportunities and limitations of the online services, if I got it right. Uh, I, I, the, about the, the, um, the cross-cultural um, work in self-help, in Sparks in particular, um, was um, developed with um, in New Zealand with, with input from um, Māori, um, so First Nation, um, clinical psychologist, um, elders, community groups, um, sort of relates to the point about something might be in the same language, but it, there's lots of big differences cross culturally and paradigms. So um, there's a project in Canada where the, pro, the intervention's been adapted for First Nation young people in Nunavut. So um, there's a lot of work, even if um, it's potentially used in the same language. Um, and I think it's about being uh, broad-minded in terms of what counts as therapeutic and um, online interventions, because Gabriel mentioned the, um, the creative uh, 
ways of engaging um, communities um, and the importance of that. And I think the intersectionality aspect to all this work is, is really important, uh, but also has its challenges because uh, we're working with quite diverse populations um, and then trying to make sure that the, the interventions are acceptable um, across um, you know, really broad um, cross-section of, of people. I want to attempt a response to um, Gabriel's first question about acknowledging indigenous local um, cultures and practices. Well, again, in the Southeast Asian context, I think it's um, useful to bear in mind that quite often when we talk about uh, culture, we often conflate it with religion. So, I mean, in, in Singapore, for example, in Southeast Asia, the the islands, uh, we've actually had, well, pre-colonization, pre-European colonization, there was another wave of Islamization. Islamization. So again, it, the, the conflation of culture and, and religion is sometimes very awkward. So maybe that's my kind of a very gentle, indirect, indirect way of saying that sometimes we have, here at least, we, we tend not to know how to acknowledge some of our local cultures because of this conflation of culture and religion. So for example, some people might assume that certain religions are part of their culture when in fact, actually um, uh, the Abrahamic religions in this part of the world were seen as foreign, were actually foreign introduced as well. Islam and Christianity were introduced in this part of the world 500 years ago. So, it's difficult for, for many of us in, in Southeast Asia to really figure out what is indigenous here. So maybe for that reason, some of us, and I'm very careful in not generalizing, some of us are careful not to go there. So that's just a point I just want to make for, for us at least. Again, I don't speak for all of Southeast Asia, of course. Do others want to react as well? Or do we have any other burning question? I still have a question, but I want to make sure that everybody that is in the room had a chance to ask if you have. No, I don't see any hands or questions in the chat. I think my question to the panelists is about safety. So we're talking about, again, online spaces, online services, and we're talking about reaching people online. In, in specifically a community that again is highly criminalized and um, discriminated against in many countries. So how do you think about safety and um, specifically in your context or if you came up with like questions around safety in your research, in your work? Uh, yeah, so if you, if you had any thoughts about that, how do you create a safe online space or that people feel that it's safe? And that it's actually safe. <laughs> You're not putting people at risk. Uh, yeah, well, for our end, for, for example, we had to also had to do an, an ethical application and we had to uh, write down how we uh, would manage uh, online safety, for example. Um, uh, so for now, at uh, they have to provide an email address to make an account, but it can be a made up email address. And um, that's actually the only thing they um, share uh, with us. Um, yeah, so that's how we would uh, guard the safety. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. I yes, think, I'm, I'm, oh, yeah, sorry. Please, no, yet, but I have to go ahead. Um, I think it might be a little bit different for us as an interest group um, compared to professional um, care services in that we have a non or semi-professional team uh, in a sense. So safety goes both ways uh, for our team, especially since our team is quite large. Um, my uh, entry to the project was mainly as all my work as a care ethicist, largely. So that's mostly my role in the project. The, there's another coordinator who's more focused on the social work and therapeutical aspect of it. Um, so for us, it was largely that I was constantly focused on, on safety, uh, 
data ethics uh, as well. Um, and that we chose a provider of our chat service that was 100% dedicated to that safety and anonymity. Um, so for us, we it, it, is, it is for us almost impossible to ascertain uh, IP data, for example, of uh, of the people who chat with us online. So it is unless they act actively give us information about themselves, we know almost nothing, which creates large largely creates the safe environment that we're looking for, both for the chatter, but also for us. So if there is a situation of of danger, necessarily we also have a responsibility legally and ethically, uh, especially. And a lot of ethical dilemmas are solved by the fact that we don't do not know specific information about the people chatting with us. So I think that was the most important for us because I noticed that most ethical dilemmas come from our uh, physical calls with people or from emails. Um, but for the chat service, it that large anonymity uh, was the, the biggest factor in that. And for our team, it's just very regularly checking up. Uh, so uh, uh, interventions with each other, um, having general meetings, having continued training, uh, which is mostly, I think for 75% of all trainings is focused on how do they provide their own limits to the ones checking, uh, checking in with us. Because of course, peer recognition can be very hard in, in the sense that it's hard to shake off others' experience and not take them with you uh, along your day. Um, so we focus on that very hard so that the, the help that we get from the community via our team is also sustainable and that we do not saddle our team up with um, problems as they actually help others. Happy to hear that it's part of you know the part of the work, right? So it's not an extra work; it's part of the work, and it's embedded in everything you do. And I definitely encourage anyone to think about safety. I'm mindful of the time. I yeah do want to first thank the speakers for taking the time to be with us today, and share your knowledge, share your experience in a very open way. I felt it was really nice to have a conversation uh, and hear from the different experiences. Thank you so much for the audience for joining. Um, yeah, we had a lot of people coming in. I hopefully managed to uh, capture all the questions. If we haven't, I'm still able to please email us uh, and we can follow up on questions that were not answered. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you Linga again for organizing this and making this happen and possible. So big thank you to Linga and yeah. If anybody wants to say something else, I also welcome if you want to share something. I see a lot of people clapping. <laughs> yeah, just claps. Thank you to everyone. It's been a great session. Great. Thank you, Matthijs. Okay. So thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful day ahead of you. Take care. Thank you, bye -bye. everyone. Bye-bye. Take care. Let's keep sharing. Bye-bye.